So how many of you like to be the one that drives? In your family, you're the wheel man. Getaway vehicle, that's you. That's your responsibility. Should we ever rob a bank, we need to turn to you. I have no plans to rob a bank. This is being recorded. <laughs> but that, that's you. I, I'm also the, the person that likes to drive. In fact, I think the last time my wife drove the two of us, it was months ago, and I think I criticized, and I think we're done uh, with me ever uh, getting to ride again, which is fine, because uh, I like to drive. But there's coming a day where when you want to go on your road trip, uh, let's say you want to go to LA, you're going to have the option, do I want to drive or are we going to let Google get us there? And some of you inside just cringed a little bit. You died inside. The machines are taking over, right? Did you woo the machines taking over? <laughs> All right, I'm on to you. I see you. Watch that person. No, it's, it's true. We, we might even have AI drive us everywhere. I hear that even drone Ubers are coming to Dallas to take you where you want to go, maybe. But we like to be in control, right? We want to be in control. That's really what it's about. That's why we like to drive. That's why we don't want AI driving us anywhere. We want to be in control. I want to be in charge. I want to be in charge of everything, not just driving. I want to be in charge of my family. So I do certain things to make sure that my family is the way that I want it to be with work. I'm in charge of my career. I remember when I was in the Army, people would tell us again and again and again, you need to be in charge of your career because nobody else is going to take care of it for you. Same thing. You probably live uh, your day-to-day -day life. Man, I am the one in charge. If I don't take care of it, it's not going to get done. And so then you come to your spiritual life and you apply the exact same principles. God works for me. I don't work for him. I've got to be in control of my life. I've got to be in control of my spiritual life. I've got to be the one in charge. And if we're honest, giving control over to God, it's kind of scary. Because he's unpredictable sometimes. He might ask me to do something I don't want to do. It's scary to give God control. So today we're in Romans 9, which as Jeff mentioned is one of the more difficult passages in Scripture. And the reason why it's difficult is it because it, it gives us one of the core biblical passages on the doctrine of election, which all of you just breathe. Uh, <clears throat> and, and so there's, there's questions around the doctrine of election. Really the question is how we become elected. Not, not political, but like sovereign God electing, right? There's questions around how, but there's not a really a question about what. The doctrine of election is a biblical doctrine. It's something that's taught, and Romans 9 is one of the passages where it's brought up. So we're going to be there, be looking at, uh, at several verses, and I want us to really take, rather than getting into the weeds of, of what does one side believe or the other side believe, we're going to save that for Wednesday at Doctrine and Dessert. So if you want to watch me get into a fist fight, you just come on Wednesday night. I'm just kidding. I won't fight anybody. You can hit me, but I won't hit back, I promise. Um, and we'll, we'll push that to a Wednesday night. And then today, we're just going to look at what does the Scriptures say about it, and why does that give us encouragement? Why is Romans chapter 9 an encouraging passage? Why is the doctrine of election something that we should find encouraging? We're going to find three things that we can surrender to find encouragement there. So the first thing we're going to surrender, we're going to surrender our fears. We're going to surrender our fears. So if you remember Romans 8, Romans 8 is awesome. It's all like everybody's, you know, like, like if you believe in Christ, you're going, to, you're going to get the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and it's awesome, and we're all adopted, and it's beautiful, and we're more than conquerors. Woohoo! And then Romans 9 comes in and is like, yeah, but not everybody's adopted. Womp womp. Yeah, but not everybody gets the Spirit of God. Womp womp. Romans 9 is, is kind of a wet blanket. It can't be read that way because Romans 8 is so encouraging. It's so encouraging. And the reason why Paul does this is because he's upset about the concept. Romans 1, uh, 1, 9, 1 through 5 is all about Paul's grief over the fact that Israel, there's some within the chosen people of Israel who are going to miss out on the blessings of salvation. And so somebody might say, well, didn't God promise the Israelites, that they would be the chosen people. So is God failing here? And that's what he says in verse 6 of Romans 9. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. You should be concerned because if God can jettison the promises that he's made to Israel, and I mean like physical Israel, not nation of today, if he can jettison his promises there, then he can jettison his promises on us at any point, at any time. And that's scary. That should concern us. 
So Paul starts dispelling this fear. And he starts in verse 6 by saying that the Jews didn't quite understand how the promises were passed down. Look at verse 6 again. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not everybody who's a physical descendant of Abraham is also a spiritual descendant of Abraham. That's what Paul's saying. This is Romans chapter 4 in one verse. The way you become a child of Abraham, whether it's physical or, or, or spiritual, the way you become a spiritual child of Abraham, rather, is through faith in the promises of God. That's what Paul's just unpacked in Romans 4. He's going to unpack it again. But a lot of our fear comes from this idea that God can just dump me at any point. God can just abandon me. I do something wrong, I screw up, I get in a rough spot, I can't quite serve the way I used to serve, whatever it is, and God's just going to abandon me. And Paul says that's not the case because God keeps his promises. And God keeps his promises really through two means. He keeps it through his power and he keeps it through his grace. Let's look at his power. God's promises are kept by his power. Paul's going to use two illustrations, two Old Testament illustrations, to show us this. Verse 7 And not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Abraham has other kids besides Isaac. If you don't know who Abraham is, he's the patriarch of the Jewish faith. He is our father of faith in some ways. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. God promised him that he would have a son and he would have land and he would have descendants. And he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so what him and his wife, Sarah, who is older and incapable of having children, they concoct this scheme that we're going to have Abraham sleep with her maidservant and produce an heir that way. And that's what they do. And then God comes in and says, hey, nice idea, but that's not how we're doing this. I'm the one in charge, and I'm going to give you a child through Sarah. And you might say, well, she can't have kids and she's older. That's my point, God says. This baby is going to be created, is going to be given to you, although it'll be done through natural means. It's going to be supernatural because I'm the one behind it. God uses his power to keep his promises. Now, some of us, that worries us because we see people with power in our culture today, and they seem to use their power to get out of keeping their promises. People use their power in our culture to abdicate their promises. They find loopholes and and contractual agreements, and they protect themselves, and that's how you use power in our day and age. And the reason why this happens is because we allow our power to dictate our character. I will do whatever I'm capable of doing. That's the human way of using power. Now, sometimes there's restraint, but for the most part, I will do whatever I'm capable of doing. If I can't get away with it, I won't do it. God is different. God's power, even though he is omnipotent, is limited. You know what it's limited by? His character. God will not do something that violates who he is. So like lying, God can't lie. Cannot do it. Cannot lie to you. Because his power is limited by his character. There's other things that God cannot do because of his character will not allow him to do it because his character influences and drives his power. And this is why election, this is why Romans 9 is really beautiful and why you can trust God with your fears. He's going to finish what he starts. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to toss you out. He's not going to kick you out when you go through a rough spot. This is the way he's been since the beginning. He hasn't changed. This isn't new. If he was keeping promises to Abraham and Isaac this way, guess what? He's still keeping promises that way to us. So what does this mean for us? Well, if God has called you to follow him, to put your faith in Christ, guess what? He's also going, he also called you to do other things. And he's not going to abandon you in the midst of that either. He's called you to glorify him at work. Why are we so afraid to do that? Why are we so afraid? Afraid you're going to lose your job? Okay, fair. But do you really think God's going to abandon you in the midst of that? Because he's not going to. 
God's called you to show your, the, share the gospel and to show the gospel. Your marriage is supposed to be a picture of the gospel. So why are we so afraid to be vulnerable of our spouse, with our spouse? Why are we so afraid to lay down our life for our wives? Why are we afraid to follow the leadership of our husbands? Well, Travis, you don't know. You don't understand. And maybe I don't. But I do know this. When you follow God in faith, he will not abandon you. It may feel like it sometimes, but he hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't left you. We're often afraid, but we can become unafraid by watching how God's power works, and it works in us, and he's going to complete what he starts. So he has power. He uses that, but he also uses his grace to keep his promises. He uses grace. Look at verse 10. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children. So Rebekah is uh, married to Isaac, children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election, there's that word, might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Woof. Travis, that doesn't sound like grace. Esau I hated. Hmm. So Paul anticipates an argument. Somebody's going to come back and say, well, yeah, God chose Isaac over Ishmael because of Sarah. They had different moms. Paul comes back, very next generation, Isaac, Rebekah, they have twin boys, and before either one of them do anything at all, God chooses one. In fact, he chooses the younger one, Jacob. Now, I don't know what your perspective is on election. There's a, a wide range. But we all believe something about election as far as Orthodox Christianity goes. And I've got them on a, on a slide. If we can kick that up, I know it was in the beginning, but if we can move to that list of verses from, or ideas from Ephesians 1. Election's a biblical concept, something that's taught in Scripture. God is the source of election. So God's the one who does it. Now, how he does it, again, whether it's based on foreknowledge, knowing what you would do, and then sort of choosing you because he knows you'll choose him or choosing unconditionally or somewhere in between. That's up to uh, you to decide. Election happened in eternity past, meaning it happened before we all got here. Believers are the object of election. So believers are chosen. Only those in Christ are elect. God elects because he loves. Now, what does that mean? It means that God doesn't have to save anyone. We are all condemned. We all fall short of the glory of God. And God could very well and would be just and right to do so, allow all of us to perish. But because he loves his creation so much, he has rescued us. And those who are rescued are called the elect. God doesn't play favorites. And that's what this passage is talking about. Before Jacob or Esau ever did anything, God chose. So God's not basing it on anything that they have done. He doesn't play favorites. And then God has a purpose for it. He's going to complete it. If you want to know more about that, like I said, you can come to Doctrine and Dessert on Wednesday, and we'll get into the nitty-gritty details of it. But there's two boys, twin boys, and before they're even born, God picks one. And Paul's saying that this one boy, Jacob, will receive the blessing, the spiritual blessing. And it's not looking ahead to future righteousness. It can't be. Because if you've read anything about Jacob, he's a total jerk. He's a big jerk. He's a liar and a cheat. But God still uses him, and the promise is passed down through him again and again and again. And if you're wondering about the Jacob I loved, Esau hated, guess what? Jacob I loved means that the, the spiritual blessing goes through Jacob. The Esau that I hated portion, God doesn't really hate Esau. It's a comparison. It says the blessing that's so great that's poured out on Jacob, it looks as though Esau is rejected. In fact, in some ways, Esau is rejected. But if you read the story of Esau, he's incredibly blessed. A nation comes from him. A nation comes from him. And all of this is rooted, it finds its locus in God's grace, God's willingness, his loving kindness. And we've been saved by grace too. That's what Romans 4 and 5 teaches. But most of us in here think God's grace stops at justification. I got saved, I experienced God's grace, and now it's up to me to work on this and figure it out. And so you walk through your life and you're like, one day... I'm a good Christian. I did good things today, and God loves me. And then the next day, I'm a bad Christian. I did bad things today, and God is not happy with me at all. I don't know. I'm working on the boy voice. I don't know. Maybe we'll try it again another time. But you can look at the doctrine of election and the way that God chooses based on his grace, not based on anything that we have done. 
And you realize how absurd that fear is that God's going to reject you because of things you've done. If God chose Jacob before he was born, before he ever did anything good or bad, and he chooses us the same way to follow him, then you're not going to be able to just, he's not going to cut you loose. He's not going to abandon his promises. That's an absurd fear. And yes, of course, faith plays a part in it. Don't hear me and say faith doesn't play a part. Of course it does. But even the faith that we have, that we put in Christ, comes from the Holy Spirit. It's not generated on our own. Grace is provided so that we might believe. Regardless of what end of the spectrum you are on election, whether you're a hardcore five-point Calvinist, or whether you're a great Arminian, and whether you're like, what are those? Arminia? Why are we in another country? No matter where you are on that spectrum, you still have to account for the fact that God chooses and that God somehow provides faith. That's biblical teaching. And both systems do a good job of that. And so we have to trust God that his grace is going to continue in our life. In fact, you've got to fall into God's grace. And then falling in love with God, fall into grace with God, maybe is a better way to think about it. He's going to keep his promises because not only can he, he wants to. He wants to keep his promises to you. And so what does that mean for us? Well, I would say if God is a God who keeps promises and we represent him, one of the things that we should probably start doing is keeping our promises. We should probably keep our promises too, right? Because I've made a promise to you and my God makes promises, so I should keep my promises as well. Commit to things. Commit early. We have opportunities to serve here at Park Cities. You've got opportunities to serve. Commit to them. Don't wait for another day. Commit to them. All right. We need to surrender our, uh, our, wow. We need to surrender our fears. Thank you. There they are. Surrender also our sense of justice. We need to surrender our sense of justice. Now, this is the part of Romans 9 where people start getting a little, little squeamish. So hold on. Buckle up. Here we go. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Is God just arbitrarily choosing people? Is God just like you, you, and you, not you, you, and you? I don't like you. I like you. What role does faith play in this? What about my faith? What about sharing the gospel? Should we even bother? Because if God's choosing people, why should I even care to share my faith? He's going to do what he's going to do. And what's really neat about this is that Paul really doesn't help us. Sorry. He just kind of keeps going. He doubles down on his argument. He keeps going with this idea that God is sovereignly in control of our lives. That's what he keeps talking about. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So he uses two more Old Testament examples to continue to explain this idea. And the first thing he's making clear is that God is completely free. God is completely free to do whatever God wants to do, as long as it's not limited by his character. So you can't make God do something. So you know, we, we, we talk about this, like, I made a deal with God. I told him that if I, I could do this, then he would do this for me. Like, I'll obey my parents every day this week, and I'll get an A on the test. That's the deal I made with God. God doesn't really work like that. At least you can't make him obligate himself to you. You know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, catch a tiger. Thank you. Wow. It was like, where did everybody's childhood go? tiger by its toe, right? And, and that's kind of how we try to get God. We try to catch him and like try to make him do stuff for us. That's not how God works. God is completely free, which means that God is going to do what God is going to do. And sometimes he chooses to enter into agreements with us, covenants with us. But for the most part, God is completely free. He is completely free. And as it relates to salvation, it says he's going to have mercy on who he will have mercy on and he will not have mercy on those that he chooses not to have mercy. And it sounds really rough. You're like, dang, man, that's, that's brutal. But then you read verse 16. Go back to 16. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. The fact that God is completely free and does what he wants to do, is, is within that is God's grace. Within that is God's mercy. So that's how, it do, that's how it's salvation by grace through faith and not through works. The fact that God is completely free allows him to pour out grace openly. And God is merciful. Psalm 103.8, Psalm 145.8, Luke 6.36, 2 Corinthians 1.3, James 5.11. God is merciful. It means full of mercy. It's for anybody who wants it. Come get it. 
All you got to do is ask, and he will give you that mercy. He'll give you that mercy. It's overflowing. It's abundant. But then you read the next couple verses, and it seems to get a little bit more complicated. Verse 17, for the scriptures say to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whoever he wills. Basically what Paul is saying here and what God is saying really is that I raised up Pharaoh to be a sovereign king of the greatest empire of his day. I brought my people to Israel or to Egypt where they were enslaved for 400 years. And then when just the right moment came, I put things in motion to where they began to be, I began to set them free. I heard their cry, I set them free using 10 plagues and a whole host of other miracles. And in order to get to 10 plagues, both Pharaoh hardened his own heart and I hardened his heart for him so that my name would become great. That is a biblical teaching. You might be sitting there thinking, well, yeah, that should happen. I mean, I've seen every single movie about the Ten Commandments. Pharaoh's the bad guy. He deserves to have his heart hardened. But then you start applying that principle down the road. Wait, is, is that my coworker? Is that that family member I've been praying for for years? Is God hardening that person's heart? What about my kids? What about my spouse? And those are legitimate questions that you should ask of the Lord. And it's why we should pray so much. But that's not Paul's point here. Paul's point isn't to get into a discussion about God's sovereignty and God's free, our free will. The point is to say that the sense of injustice that we have that rises up in this is from the Lord. We all have a sense of justice, right? And our sense of justice is this. If you do good things, you deserve reward. If you do bad things, you deserve to be punished. That's how we work. That's how we operate. And for the most part, that makes sense. But the problem is, when you come to God and you apply the same principles and you think that God should submit to our sense of justice rather than us submitting to his sense of justice. Everything that God does is just. Remember how I mentioned earlier there are things in his character that allows him to not do certain things? One of the things that God cannot do is be unjust. He can't be unjust. It's not a part of his character. So maybe you don't know where you stand on the doctrine of election, but here's one of the things that should give us great comfort about Romans 9 and about the doctrine of election. However God brings about salvation, however all these pieces work together, it's the right way and it's the best way. It's the right way, it's the best way. It's best for us, it's best for God's glory, and never in a million years, if we all got in a room together and had to devise a plan to save humanity from their sins, never in a million years would we come up with, all right, what we need to do is we need to get God to put on flesh, come and live a perfect life, die on a cross for our sins, and and then everybody else is just going to put their faith in him. We'd never come up with that. You know what we'd come up with? Here's 10 rules, keep them. Here's eight rules, keep them. You broke them, sorry, you lost out. That's what we'd come up with. God is completely just, and his justice is perfect. And when it comes coupled with his mercy and his grace, you get the cross of Christ. Because God has to punish sin. He can't let it go. He can't let it slide because he can't be unjust. So he sends his son to keep the law perfectly, and then he punishes him. He has him killed. Not for his sins. Jesus didn't do anything wrong, but for ours. And his his sacrifice is accepted. He's resurrected. That's how we know his sacrifice is accepted. And then those of us who put our faith in him and now have access to the promise of blessing, which is salvation. And you can do that today. You can be counted among God's elect today. All you need to do is place your faith in that sacrifice. We should give God great praise because he had devised something that doesn't depend on us to get it done, but it depends on him. And so because we now are in Christ, those of us who put our faith in him, guess what happens? We now have to represent him to other people. And the way that we represent him is by adopting, one of the ways we represent him, is by adopting his sense of justice. We adopt his sense of justice. What I think is right or wrong shouldn't be dependent on what culture tells me, what society tells me, what everybody uh, around me tells me. You know what my sense of right and wrong should be? What God says. What God says. 
So I guarantee you there are some people in this room, either you are or you're thinking about having an affair. And you're thinking about it because your spouse is absent, always working, doesn't get you anymore, y'all have grown apart. It's your neighbor, your coworker, somebody around you is giving you that attention you crave and you're justifying it. But that is not God's sense of justice. You made a promise. Remember how we talked about keeping promises? Keep that promise that you made that wedding day so long ago. Maybe it wasn't that long ago at all. Remember that promise. Confess, repent, turn away. Some of us, our sense of justice doesn't allow us to forgive people because right and wrong, good and bad, they hurt me, I'm not going to let them hurt me again. Well, guess what? God says to forgive because I'm forgiving. Let your sense of justice be informed by who God is and what he asks of us. So we surrender our fears. We surrender our sense of justice. We also need to lastly surrender our timetable. Here's a point where Paul, I think, maybe actually is interacting with a, um, an actual opponent. This isn't a hypothetical. Uh, verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Basically, if God's going to do what God's going to do, why should I care? Why should I change what I'm going to do? He's going to do whatever he's going to do. It's fatalistic, right? Just whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And again, Paul does a great job here of not resolving any of the angst that we feel between free will and God's sovereignty. Instead, he doubles down. And he basically says, even if I were to explain to you how God's sovereignty and his free will works, you wouldn't get it. And it's still not our place to challenge him. Look at verse 20. But who are you, O oh man? Now that O oh man is not derogatory. It's designed to show you the great gap between you as the created person and God as the creator. So who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? He's the potter, we're the clay. The clay doesn't have a right to come to God and say, you screwed up. Now what, God's, what Paul's not saying, what God's saying, or not saying here, is that you don't get to, he's not saying you can't question God. You absolutely can question God. You can ask him, why am I going through this? God, it hurts. I'm struggling. I don't want to do this anymore. Why have you put me in this situation? That's absolutely okay. What is wrong is, and this word answer back, this answer back to God, is the same one found in Luke 14, 6, where the Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus, and they can't find a way to answer back to him. What this means is, you're trying to trap God. You're trying to put God on trial. That's not allowed because God doesn't answer to you. You're allowed to go to him with humility and with, as a child and say, Lord Jesus, I'm hurting. Why is this like this? Why am I struggling with the things that I struggle with? That's in bounds. Sticking a finger in God's face and accusing him of wrongdoing, that is out of bounds. That's out of bounds because we wouldn't get it. And Paul tells us why we wouldn't get it, because we don't see the big picture. Look at verse 22. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? Somehow, some way, whether actively because God is doing it or passively God is allowing someone to do it, People are prepared for destruction, meaning eternal condemnation. Now, again, I'll let you wrestle with that. We'll wrestle with that a little bit on uh, Wednesday. But there's a big picture. And God is waiting patiently for that big picture to completely unfold. It's a key word in here. Waiting patiently, enduring with much patience. God is patient with us. Now, why is he patient with us? For two reasons. One... He wants more people to come to know him. That's Romans 2.4. His kindness leads us to repentance. He wants more people to come to know him. So the reason why Jesus just hasn't dropped back out of the sky and been like, all right, let's fix this, is because he's waiting for more and more people to come to know him, more and more people to be saved. But he's also allowing this rebellion against him to swell. And there's a reason why. God likes it when the odds are stacked against him. Because when the odds are stacked against him, guess what happens when he wins? He gets glory. He gets honor, he gets praise, and his name becomes greater and greater and greater. And that's a good thing. When God's name is made great, it's good for us too, those of us who follow him. It's good for us too. So we want to see God's name made great. And this is why he's enduring with patience. Here's the bottom line. God's ways are not our ways. 
God's timetable is not our timetable. There's things that we want. We want them now. We live in an I want it now culture. And God says, "Mm -mm, wait, wait. One of the best disciplines that you could cultivate in your life as far as helping to see the big picture of God is this idea of patience. You need to surrender your timetable to God. You can surrender your timetable for future growth to him. That's one thing you can surrender to him. There's all things in our, we all have things in our life that make us think we're, we're failing, we're falling short. Maybe it's sin in our life that's just there. And we kind of think, I'll get to that another time. I'll deal with it another day. Don't wait. There's no good reason not to deal with that now. God's timetable is this idea of us relentlessly, sort of urgently pushing out of our lives the things that are not in line with his character because we're being shaped more and more into the image of Christ. So push those things out of your life. I guarantee you when I mention that, there's something you immediately thought of. What if you tackled that this week? What if you tackled that this week? The other thing we need to push out as far as the timetable goes, we need to surrender our timetable for what's next to the Lord. We all want to be somebody. We all want to become something. We all want to take the next step in life. We hate stagnation. I get it. But God has a timetable for your life. He's got things he wants you to do, and he has a timing for when it's going to take place. So give him your plans. Give him your future. High schoolers, you're about to go off to college. You're about to go off to college, and it's a four-year school. Some of you are going to take five, six. You're not going to walk out with a doctorate either. It's just going to be six years of bachelor. That is totally fine. If the reason why it's taking you so long to get done is because you are pursuing Christ. You're going on mission trips. You're serving. You're volunteering. Take the time you need. Sorry, parents. But if it's because you're playing Xbox, that's different. There's a place for Xbox. Timetables. Surrender your timetable to the Lord. Surrender your timetable for what's next to the Lord and watch him work. The doctrine of election is difficult and it should leave us with a sense of wonder, but it should also leave us with a sense of giving God control because God is in control. Whether or not we give him that control, guess what? I don't think really matters because God is in control. So let's surrender to him our fears. Whatever you're worried about, give it to him. Whatever you're thinking about that's just holding you back, give it to him. Whatever, whatever thing that's got you just stuck in a, in a decision between right and wrong, I can't believe they did that, give him that. And then give him your timetable and watch him work and be surprised at the great grace and power of God that's poured out by him being in control of your life and not you. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, it's amazing that you're in control, that we have a God who cares enough about us, loves us enough to rule our lives and be sovereign over us. And so, Lord, if there's anybody in this room that hasn't given you their lives, Lord God, I pray that that would be them today. I pray that the idea of giving someone else charge of their life would be appealing because maybe life's hard right now. I pray that each of us in this room would take something, if we're followers of you, and would turn it over to you today rather than trying to hold on to it, Lord. Take our fears, take our sense of right and wrong, Take our timetables, Lord, and use them for your glory. Make your name great and to bring others to you. That's in your son's name. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.